Okay. Welcome back, all of you who have been here before. I hope you missed our time together and are glad to be back and ready to dig into the Bible again. And I want to welcome all of you folks who are here for the first time or who haven't been here for a while. We are so glad that you are here and hope that you enjoy your time in Bible study. Uh, before we get started, uh, just a couple reminders. And the first is <laughs> we are here to study the word together. And we always remind ourselves at the very beginning that we need the help of the Holy Spirit to study the Word. We can't do this without God's help. And yes, I may do the bulk of the talking, but we are studying this together. And there will always be time for questions and comments because we all are still learning. And I will say this. And I know some of you will disagree with me, but I will say it. There are no stupid questions. That's not a challenge. <laughs> but please, if you're sitting there with a question, raise your hand. Probably somebody else has it as well. Um, just a reminder, there are regular size print and large print Bibles scattered around. If you're sitting there saying that the smaller print is hard, ask someone to help you find a large print. I also encourage you, bring your own Bible with you so you can make notes. I see a lot of you have done that. Um, I do ask for volunteers to read. Please don't feel obligated to, but if you do read, please read out of the, the version we're all reading together because there was one year people were reading from different versions and it was just chaos. <laughs> so we're reading from the ESV. Um, there's coffee and hot water for tea and Anne brought some goodies cookies. for us. Cookies. 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 And uh, so please feel free to get up at any time. They're delicious. Uh, they've already been sampled and pronounced delicious. <laughs> delicious. So uh, please feel free to get up. Um, and just a reminder, if you don't, no, uh, Lisa is recording this so everyone can see that Debbie McCain is late. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, they would not have seen had you not mentioned. <laughs> uh, so please clean up your language because this is being recorded. And if you do happen to miss a week, the lessons are put on our YouTube channel at some point during the week. And uh, so you can catch up if you do miss a week. But it's not the same to watch a recorded Bible study as it is to be here. So before we jump in, let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so glad to be here tonight as a part of your church, studying your word. And Lord, as always, we ask that you would send your spirit to empower us and illumine our minds. Help us, Lord, to hear and perceive all that you would say to us tonight through your word. And we are so grateful, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, last year, somebody, and I don't remember who, requested the book of Exodus. And since we spent all of last year in the New Testament, I thought it'd be time to come back to the Old Testament. And I remember when the person requested Exodus, something, a little light went off in my head and I said, yeah, that's it. That's what we need to study. So we are studying the book of Exodus. And as always, before we dig in, I like to give some background and some context to help us understand what we're reading. It's always important to put a book of the Bible in context, especially a book like this, which is a book of history. Now, if you're a nerd like me who loves history, that was my major in college, you're going, yay, I love history. I know some of you don't like history. Hopefully, you will like this history um, because it's our history. We're reading about our own family are adopted into the family of Israel through Jesus Christ. So we're seeing 
how God deals with his people. That's a big theme here in the book of Exodus. You can't understand Exodus unless you understand where we left off at the end of Genesis. So we talked a little bit about this yesterday in worship. The book of Genesis ends with the patriarch Joseph. Oh as, I'm sorry? I just said they like coffin. And yes, he dies. <laughs> yeah. Joseph was the number two guy in Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. He invited his whole family to come from um, the land of Canaan at the time it was called to come and live in the land of Goshen in Egypt. That's not Goshen, Indiana. It's Goshen, which was the rich Nile Delta area where the Nile empties into the Mediterranean. So you can imagine that rich alluvial soil that uh, uh, he invited his family to come and live in the best part of the land. And when his family came, to live in Egypt, there were 70 men, not counting wives and daughters. <coughs> Sorry, ladies, that's just the way they counted at the time. I'm not endorsing it, I'm just saying it's the way it was. So God had told Abraham, so telling Joseph's great-grandfather, when God made that covenant with Abraham at the beginning of Genesis, he told him, I'm going to increase you in numbers, which was crazy because Abraham didn't have any children at the time. Number the stars, yeah. I will increase you in number. Your family will become a great people and your people, your descendants will be slaves in a foreign land for 400 years. God told that many generations before it happened to Joseph's great-grandfather. And that prophecy we'll see is fulfilled here at the beginning of the book of Exodus because the Israelites come to live in Egypt for a time. It's a good place for them to be. But as we will read, history passes and a new pharaoh after however much time we don't know a new pharaoh comes to the throne who doesn't know anything about Joseph you see why it's important to know your history to know where you've come from and he doesn't know anything about Joseph he just knows there's this whole group of people who are different from us they're not like us. And he's threatened by that. Because they're growing. This other kind of people, they don't speak the language we speak. They don't worship the way we worship. They don't, they don't do things the way that we do things. And he's threatened by that. And he decides to, the way to do that, to stop them from being a threat is to enslave them. And that's what happens. The Hebrews become slaves in Egypt. And so the book of Exodus is the story of how God delivers his people from slavery. How he then forms them into a nation by giving them the law. They don't have the law yet. We won't get that until Exodus chapter 20. He reaffirms his covenant with them. He made a covenant with Abraham. It was passed on to Isaac, passed on to Jacob, Joseph. Now God's going to reaffirm that covenant that through them, the whole world will be blessed. Many people have forgotten that promise. God never has. And he's forming these people into a nation in fulfillment of these prophecies because from this nation is going to come ultimately Jesus Christ. That's the long view here. So that's the, the, broad, the broad scope here of the book of Exodus. The tradition is this book was written by Moses. Moses. 
Moses, the tradition goes, wrote the first five books of the Bible. Now, of course, of course the books were edited at some point because there's a place in one of the books, I should have looked it up, where it says Moses was the most humble man on the whole earth. I don't think he wrote that personally or else he wouldn't have been the most humble man on the whole earth. And I'm pretty sure he didn't write the part about his own death. So somebody came along and edited what he wrote. But up until the 19th century, everybody believed, agreed, accepted these books were written by Moses. I think it takes more faith to believe some of the other theories. And if you're interested in them, I'll talk with you about them after <laughs> Bible study. But it was written by Moses, OK? And if you are interested, the Jews call the first five books of the Bible the Torah. You might have heard that term. Sometimes Torah is used to mean the whole Old Testament, but usually it's referring to these first five books. The word Torah means instruction. The Greeks called it the Pentateuch. You might have heard that word. You see penta in there. Penta means five. five. First five books. It's just another handy term. Um, the name Exodus comes from when the Old Testament was translated into Greek. It's from the Greek word. It means departure. The Hebrew, in the tradition, they call the books by the first word of the book. And so in Hebrew, this book is called Names, which isn't very helpful because it, there's not really a lot about names in this book. But you'll see that uh, that's the first, the first word. Um, the big question is the date. When did this happen? There are all kinds of arguments about when exactly the exodus occurred in history. There are two big theories. Um, it's interesting, as we'll read Exodus, Moses will give us a lot of details, and he'll give us a lot of names, but there's one name he never gives us. He never tells us which pharaoh we're dealing with. Uh which tells you a lot about who God says is important and who the world says is important. Because we have the list of all the pharaohs and we know when they reigned. But we don't know the name of this particular pharaoh. Interestingly, as we'll see, we'll be given the names of two minor characters here in chapter 1. Two female Hebrew midwives. God tells us their names, but we never find out pharaoh's name. I think that's kind of delightful, personally. Um, but I do have a dark sense of humor, I know. So I'm going on the tradition. What makes sense to me is that the Exodus happened somewhere around the year 1440 BC. Now remember, in BC, you're counting down to zero rather than counting up. So 1440 is around. 1,440 years before the birth of Jesus. So around 3,500 years ago, somewhere around then. Um, there are some biblical clues that help us reach that date. One is in 1 Kings chapter 6. It tells us that Solomon began to build the temple in the 480th year after the Israelites came out of Egypt which was the fourth year of Solomon's reign. We know the fourth year of Solomon's reign was around the year 966. So you count backwards, you get somewhere around the 1440s. Um, similarly, in Judges, Jephthah, the judge, writes a letter to um, one of the local kings, and he says that Israel has been in the land about 300 years. Jephthah lived around the year 1100, so you get the general idea. Um, similarly, in the book so of that's, Acts, that's when Joseph's brothers came and settled. No, they were they came four hundred years before that. So in the eighteen about eighteen hundred years before Jesus, fourteen forty is the day of the Exodus <laughs> when they left Egypt 
Then they wandered for 40 years. They came into the land around the year 1400. They left 1440. They entered Israel 1400. So. Where were they before Israel? In Egypt. They were in Egypt for 400 years. Where were they before they went into Egypt? Well, there were only a family of about 70 there in the land of Canaan, which okay. is Israel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, similarly in the book of Acts, Paul says the time between the conquest of Israel and the capture of Jerusalem is 450 years. And so that we know when David conquered Jerusalem, you count back 450 years, that's about the date that they came into the land, which is about 1400. They wandered for 40 years in the, in the wilderness, so 1440, they came out of Egypt. So the Bible is consistent with a date of the Exodus around 1440. BC, but there's still some people who are looking at other archaeological evidence. Partly we'll see here one of the names of the cities that the Israelites as slaves are forced to build is named Ramses. There was a great pharaoh Ramses, but he lived 200 years after this. So they're saying, well, if that's named after Ramsey, I don't know why they don't think there can't be someone else named Ramses. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, you know, that's one of the arguments you'll hear. But anyway, the big theme here, and here we'll talk about the structure of the book before we jump in. Again, God is keeping his promises. That's part of why I put it out on the black sign uh, at the corner of Broadway and Vine. God is faithful to his promises. And we'll see here, he promised he would deliver his people, and he does. He promised he would use his people to save the world from sin and brokenness and fallenness and violence, and we know he does. And we're seeing here part of how over the centuries God continued to be faithful to the promises he made, the covenant he made, even when his people are not faithful to him. Praise God, right? Because I'm not faithful to him like I should be, but I can trust he will be faithful to me. He's nurturing his promise through his people. And he's going to rescue his people, form them into a nation, reaffirm his covenant. Also, he can reestablish the relationship where he lives with us. You read the original creation intent. God walked with Adam and Eve and fellowshiped with them in the cool of the evening, in the garden. That's what was lost. That's the definition of paradise. To be with God, face to face, without fear. And to glorify him and enjoy him forever. The problem is sin is getting in the way of that. And so God is working. He's going to remove that barrier so that one day, we skip ahead to the end of Revelation, we're going to see, we're going to be face to face with him again, without fear, without guilt, without shame. He starts to put that together again because we're going to see in Exodus, that's when they build the tabernacle, where God dwells in their midst. Now, there's still a barrier. They can't just saunter in anytime they want, but he's going to be here on earth again with us. So the first about third of the book is the rescue, the great deliverance event. Moses is born. We skip very quickly through 80 years of his life. And then Moses becomes the great deliverer. We've got the plagues. We've got the Passover, etc. And they leave the land. The middle third of the book is they're on their way to Mount Sinai where they're going to receive the law. God's going to form them into a people. There's problems along the way. I know it'll shock you. <laughs> you get a whole bunch of people, you take them out for a great big camping trip in the desert, and not everybody's happy. <laughs> Go figure. And then the last third of the book is the building of the tabernacle. And I will tell you, 
We're going to read about how they're going to build the tabernacle. We're going to read how they built the tabernacle. And then we're going to read how they built the tabernacle. It's a little repetitive, but that's okay. <laughs> so this is the main salvation event in the Old Testament. After this, the majority of the time that God introduces himself, he's going to say, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of slavery in Egypt. That's the main deliverance in the Old Testament. It lays a pattern for the great deliverance to come in the New Testament. I'll just tell you a couple parallels. We've already mentioned before this, there's 400, there's 400 years between the end of Genesis and the beginning of Exodus. We don't know what happened in those 400 years. God was silent. You end the Old Testament, you read the end of Malachi, and you turn over from Malachi to Matthew, and guess how long there is between those two books? 400 years. It's like God is quietly working behind the scenes, and then boom, it explodes. He's doing something great. The beginning here, we've got the birth of a very special baby, a baby boy. He's threatened from infancy. We're not sure he's going to make it. We skip over the beginning. We've got the birth of a very special baby boy whom the king is trying to kill from infancy. It's crazy, the pattern that is established here. So, because God in the New Testament wants to rescue us from our slavery to sin, form us into a new people, the church, and establish a new relationship with us. And what are we doing the entire time? We're whining and complaining and saying, God, why? <laughs> right? Or is it just me? <laughs> so as you're reading here, look for those parallels because human nature has not changed from the beginning. The hairstyles are different, the clothes are different, the language and customs are different, the people are just the same. So, um, I'm a visual person, I like handouts and maps and charts, so I gave you a map here. Um, I also gave you an outline of, um, you can thank Judy for this bright pink. I said, put this on something pretty, and this is what she brought me. And I'm like, oh, I'm blind. I can't see. Um, I love it. You won't be able to lose it. I like it, Judy. Uh, <laughs> so if you are not a visual person, if this map and this outline are not going to help you, give it to somebody else, pass it along, throw it away. There's no quiz. There's no test. But... Stick it in your Bible, it, we'll be referring to it, at least the maps, especially when they leave, just go to Mount Sinai. So, um, questions before we dig into chapter one? I love it when there's no questions, it means I taught it perfectly. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, anytime you have questions, please feel free. Who would like to be my first reader? Who'd like to read chapter one? Anne, thank you very much. I apologize already for the name. <laughs> They're not here to get offended if you mispronounce their name. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Ishakar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, all the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. 
Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses, but the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves, and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick, and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Puah, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him, but if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Okay. So, an interesting start here to our story. Um, as I mentioned, Moses begins the narrative here by reminding us what has gone before, um, giving us the names of Jacob's 12 sons. Of course, Jacob was given a new name, Israel. And these 12 sons become the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, when they went down to Egypt, the family was 70 strong. Um, but eventually they, they died, of course. But interestingly, we see here they obeyed the very first command given in the Bible, which is God told the animals and God told Adam, be fruitful and multiply. And they do, uh, which is a sign of God's blessing here. And they grew exceedingly strong, we are told, and the land was filled with them. And with that, Moses glosses over 400 years of history and jumps ahead. And a new pharaoh comes to power who does not know anything about Joseph, does not look on the Israelites as a blessing. He clearly had not been trained in the glories of diversity. <laughs> he didn't like these people that were different. He saw them as a problem that had to be dealt with rather than a people who could be a blessing to his land. And so from the very beginning, this Pharaoh sets himself up in opposition to God because God had very clearly told Abraham, those who bless you, I will bless. And those who curse you, I will curse. And I don't think that principle has changed. If you bless Israel, you will be blessed. If you bless God's people, you will be blessed. If you set yourself up against God's people, through whom God is working to bless the whole world, then you are not in a position to receive blessing, right? You're setting yourself up against God. So from the very beginning, we know Pharaoh's going to lose. There's some hoops to jump through before we get there. But Pharaoh is setting himself up in opposition to God and to the people that God had chosen 
to use to bless the entire world. Pharaoh didn't care about any of that. He just saw, we've got a threat here. These people are not like us. These people are a separate nation within our nation. We don't know what they're going to do. They're a threat to us and our way of life. We've got to deal with them. We see parallels all over to the 20th century. Do I have to draw a picture here? Here's this minority group of people. Their ways are strange and foreign. We don't know who ultimately their allegiance is to, but it's probably not to me, to Pharaoh. They're probably going to do what they want to do. And so we've got to deal with them in some terrible way. It didn't work for Hitler, it didn't work for Stalin, it didn't work for Pol Pot, it's not gonna work for Pharaoh here. Um, the fear we see though is when we go to war, he says it very clearly here and I'm trying to find which verse, they may join with our enemies and we'll have to fight from within as much, verse 10, yeah. We'll have to fight from within as much as without. So he sees this as a matter of national security here. Um, they're going to join with our enemies and rise up against us. And so Pharaoh devises a twofold strategy here to deal with the Israel problem. And the first is let's enslave them. Let's enslave them. Put them down, take away their power, deny their humanity. So we're going to redefine what it means to be human. To be human, you have to be what? Egyptian. Egyptian. And they're not. So they're not human. Almost every people group has done this at some point in their history. The word Lakota, which is one of the names of one of our Native American tribes. Do you know what it means? It means the people. Mm -hmm. So if you're not Lakota, you're not people. Mm -hmm. Or at one time, they believed that. No, I'm not saying they do now. Uh, but we've done this all over the world, haven't we? Oh, there's us, and there's them. Mm -hmm. you know, they're not like us. Mm -hmm. So we will deny that they are human. We'll just redefine Humanity. Anytime we redefine humanity, we get a huge problem. Anytime we don't follow God's definition, which is you're created in the image of God. And so that's what makes you human. Whether you are Egyptian or not, whether your skin is this color or that color, whether you're a man or a woman, whether you all of your body parts work in the way that they should work, or you have a disability of some kind, we redefine humanity and say they're excluded, they're not for real, then we get problems and we get suffering. Always. We haven't learned that lesson yet. It's still going on today. Um, there are more slaves being held today than at any other time in history. Especially if you count the human trafficking that's happening all over the world. Um, so we will enslave them and we will well, let's get some good for the economy out of them, right? Cheap labor, that's a wonderful thing, right? And we, we've got these building projects, two storehouse cities, Pithom and Ramses. Uh, they have done archaeological digs in these areas, and they have found there was a large amount of Asiatic foreigners living there at the time. Um, and they found a factory producing glazed tiles also. So uh, the archaeological evidence confirming what we read here uh, in the Bible. But interestingly, the more the Israelites were oppressed, the more they multiplied and the more they spread. And Pharaoh's head just must have almost exploded. <laughs> you know, because I keep trying to put them down and they keep... Making more. Growing and making more. And what are we going to do? Well, when you work against God, it's never going to work for you. So we have, the, in the language, it escalates here that the service is bitter. It's hard service. It's ruthless. 
and keep trying to be more and more oppressive and the Israelites keep growing and spreading and getting more intimidating and stronger. So we need strategy number two, which is eugenics, right? If we can't keep them down by enslaving them, then we can stop them from breeding. And we're still doing that today, right? You know, especially starting in the early 20th century with Margaret Sanger and, you know, where he, she decided these groups of people shouldn't breed, including black people and um, people with intellectual disabilities and all kinds of other people that were not worthy of life, life or, or contributing to the, again, we've redefined humanity, right? They don't qualify. So it's absolutely horrific here how dehumanized the Israelites have become in Pharaoh's eyes, and we jump to these two midwives. I am assuming they're the head midwives, because there hadn't been more than two. Um, but we're, named, we're told of these two, Shifra and Pua. Again, how interesting, <coughs> we're not told the name of the Pharaoh, yeah. but we're told about Pua and Shifra. Heroines in the history of God's people. And shows you who is important in God's eyes and who is important in ours. So clearly, in this 400 years of history between the end of Genesis and the beginning of Exodus, faith has been at least somewhat preserved because these women we are told clearly, choose to do what is right in the eyes of God rather than what Pharaoh tells them to do. So we have some civil disobedience going on here. When the state tells you to do something that is wrong, who are you going to follow? And we're told this two times. They feared God more than they feared Pharaoh. Pharaoh tells the midwives to do the unthinkable. When a girl baby is born, let her live. When the boy baby is born, kill it, throw it in the Nile. Considering how much they relied on the Nile, I can only imagine, you know, that would ruin swimming for me. You see, anyway, I won't go more into that. But Here's the great irony in all of this. Pharaoh is afraid of the Hebrew men. He wants to get rid of the men because he's afraid the men are going to rise up against him and challenge his authority. The men are going to go to war against us and join with our enemies. The men are going to do violence to us and overthrow us. In chapters 1 and 2, it's the women who rebel against him and ignore his authority and do civil disobedience and flout his power. You've got these two Hebrew midwives. We're going to see next week Moses' mother, Jochebed, has a baby boy and hides him for three months. Moses' sister, Miriam, is the one who watches the baby. And who finds the baby? Jump ahead, see if you remember. Princess. Pharaoh's own daughter is the one who adopts the one who eventually is going to deliver the Hebrews from the Egyptians. He goes after the men because he can't imagine that the women are going to be any threat. And God's like, oh, honey, let me show you what I can do. Ship power. That's right. We've got girl power here. So I think it's absolutely wonderful. And when people tell me, oh, the Bible is oppressive to women, I don't know what book they're reading. So the midwives disobey. And then they come up with this cockamamie story 
Oh, you know, these Hebrew women, they're, they're not like your delicate Egyptian flowers. They're, they're vigorous, and before we can even get there, they've already had the baby, and what are we supposed to do? I love it. So, it reminds me of the hiding place, right? Where they're hiding the Jews, and yes, they're telling lies, but, uh, you know, sometimes you wrestle with the ethics of that, but God says nothing about the lie here, and he holds them up as heroines for saving the people, <laughs> saving the lives, yeah. And he blessed them for their obedience. So we end here with some foreshadowing of what is coming. We've got, uh, we're looking for a boy baby to be born. There's going to be continued civil disobedience. The threat of children being tossed into the Nile to drown. And God is at work behind the scenes, getting ready for the big thing that he's going to do. So questions, thoughts? Yes, Karen. Um, in reading this chapter, um, and reading some of the books that you suggested, uh, it says that the first word in Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, should be the word and. It's a continuation yeah. of Genesis. But with Pharaoh trying to do away with God, he's doing away with Jesus. Mm-hmm. So he's and that's to, not going to go well with him. No, it's going to kill God, but it's killing Jesus, and Jesus is our Savior. So right. it's not going to happen. And then no. the other part is the first part where he talks about, um, you know, the midwives, civil. Okay, if you go back to Philippians, where Paul talks about, do you obey the laws of the government? Or the laws of God. Mm -hmm. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and render unto God what is God's. Right. So I mean, it, it, it's bringing the taste of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's yeah. There, there's there's so many parallels that you can't understand the Old Testament without the New, and you can't understand the New mm -hmm. Testament without the Old. They they they. Fit that's together. that's why I don't understand why that pastor decided that we don't need the Old Testament anymore. I think he, he might be in a different kind of heaven than I have planned for <laughs> <laughs> Well, I obviously disagree because I use the Old Testament all the time and we're teaching it now, you know, right. so. Uh, yeah, I, and you know, they're all, all throughout history, this same problem, and you know, we've seen it in our time as well, when the state tries to take power that is reserved only for God. Um, FYI, this is in no way a political statement. Let me say that right away, because you know, we're in election season, so I have to be careful. But you might remember there was a court case that went all the way to the Supreme Court not too long ago, where the government was trying to mandate a Catholic um, monastic order to pay against their conscience for abortions. And it went all the way under the Affordable Care Act, it went all the way to the Supreme Court. Did the state have the power to tell these Catholic nuns they had to pay for abortions for their employees or not? And thankfully the Supreme Court said no. But the fact that it had to be fought, we're still in that same struggle. Are you gonna obey the state? Or are you gonna obey God? God says obey the state until they tell you to do something that is wrong, evil, you know. So it's not that we can say the state doesn't have any power over me. No, God or God put the state in authority. But the state is full of sinful people, no matter what state we're talking about, and sometimes they go over the line and then we're stuck and we suffer and we have to make a choice, you know. And I mean, lobby joined in with that too, didn't they? I mean, yeah, I believe they did. Yeah, yeah there, there, there were several cases I think that were joined together. Yeah, and mm -hmm. they dealt with the same similar. Yeah, thing. yeah, and it's you know it's not going to go away because it's right. been this way for thousands and thousands of years. Um, so 
you know, we shouldn't be surprised, <laughs> but we are when it does. Um, so it's just, you know, when that comes, we pray that we have the wisdom and the strength to say, uh, I'm going to fear God rather than fear Pharaoh. So, other questions or thoughts? If you ever get a new dog or cat, I recommend Pua or Shifra <laughs> as uh, good biblical names that we don't generally use for our children. But they're heroines. We should remember them. Yeah. So, next week we will see the birth of Moses. And as I said, we'll jump ahead 40 years and then jump ahead another 40 years and we'll see Moses meeting God at the burning bush for the first time at the age of 80. So those of you telling me, I'm old, I'm going to step back. He didn't start with Moses until he was 80. So there's no retirement age in God's kingdom. Yeah. Abraham, Sarah didn't have her baby until she was 90. Okay, so let's close with prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for gathering us together tonight. Thank you for your word. It is comforting. It is challenging. And we love this word that you have given to us and how you still speak to us through it. We pray that you would help us to remember these things in the days and weeks ahead. Go with us, Lord. Keep us safe. Help us to shine your light. And gather us together again next week in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for coming.